Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. For me, it's the evening and it's delightful. And well, this is the sixth annual Valentine's Essential Vegan Desserts Extravaganza. So I'm really excited about it. Um, I like Valentine's Day. Also, you know, hearts, very nice. I think we should all be, I think we should all be loving one to each other all the time. It's also Heart Health Month, February. So I've got a lot of heart-shaped things here and some different desserts, a little bit something for everyone, I hope, although the main event is Baked Alaska. However, we are going to look at a bunch of desserts and I'm going to get to as many questions as I can this evening, hopefully all of them. I just want to remind you, particularly if you haven't been here before, on the right side of your screen, there's a question queue, and you can just type in a question, and I'll see it and answer it. Hopefully, I'll know the answer. If I won't, if I don't, and this goes for everyone, you can always reach out to me with a question or a follow-up or anything at all, fran at ruby.com. So welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for spending either your late afternoon or your early evening with me. And I want to get right to the main event. Actually, I don't. I take that back. I want to welcome my new students, Essential Vegan Dessert students, and remind everyone to please join the Facebook group. This is a private Facebook group for Essential Vegan Desserts students only. Any problems of a technical nature, write to support at ruby.com. And again, you can, everyone here, just reach out and write to me at fran at ruby.com. I'll be happy to um, help you out, answer your question, just get to know you. So I'm going to ask Patrick to, we've got some images of a beautiful cake in a couple of stages. This is a cake that was my breakthrough cake. There it is, a heart-shaped cake that was really a round cake. I baked a nine inch or an eight inch round layer and freehand cut it into a heart. And Hannah Kaminsky, who is at Bittersweet, you may know her, she's written a number of books, very talented cookbook author, recipe developer, and food photographer, did this cake for me and photographed it. So this here, it's shown the cake has been chilled, cut into the heart shape. It's much easier to finish cakes, to cut them when they're cold and then glazed with a simple ganache. And the other pieces, I think Patrick, that we have a picture of the cake. Yeah. <laughs> so there's the cake as I was cutting it. I will tell you that I did eat a bit of the pieces. I mean, it's so delicious and it's really a very simple cake to make, but I crumbed some of those cut pieces as well to put over the cake. And we might have a picture, I think, of just the cake glazed. I'm not really sure. Is there another photo, Patrick, or was there's not? Okay, so that's it. So. This cake is very versatile. There is an event document that you can see on the top of the screen. You can download it and it has a recipe for the cake that I call the chocolate cake to live for. It was my breakthrough cake when I left the traditional pastry world, started, became a vegan over 25 years ago and wanted to recreate really unapologetically luscious and delicious vegan cakes. Took a lot of testing, uh, but there is that cake. There is a gluten-free version. There is a no oil version. I made that cake for Dr. McDougall, for Rip Esselstyn's wedding, and most recently for plant-based uh, nutrition support group for people who don't use any oil. The cakes are different, but they can be really good. 
So I'm gonna ask Patrick, our wonderful producer, to run the video of making aquafaba meringue. And then I'm going to take some questions too about aquafaba. And I am going to show you one that I made in advance. I'm going to assemble one and I'm gonna give you some ideas for doing other things with the meringue as well. So we can roll the video now, please, Patrick. To make vegan meringue, add the bean water, also known as aquafaba, and cream of tartar to a stand mixer, and beat until the mixture becomes somewhat opaque in color. Next, with the mixer on low, slowly start to incorporate the sugar, about a tablespoon at a time. Beat the mixture, increasing the speed of the mixer for approximately one minute between each addition of sugar. You can see the mixture start to change both color and texture as soon as more sugar gets added. If needed, scrape the sides of the bowl and continue until all of the sugar has been incorporated. You can see as the sugar gets added, the mixture starts to look more and more like meringue. Once all of the sugar has been incorporated, continue to beat the meringue on high speed for an additional 10 minutes or so. Lastly, reduce the speed to medium-low and add the vanilla. When done, the meringue should be glossy and form stiff peaks like this. If the peaks seem too soft and fold over like this, continue to beat the mixture until it looks like this. This meringue can be used in any way that a regular meringue can be used. Here we are using it to make homemade s'mores. It can also be piped onto desserts such as baked Alaska, Top with sugar and brulee like a marshmallow. Okay, so you can see I really love working with aquafaba. Real key to it is to reduce the chickpea liquid ahead. And everyone who's registered here can go and look at a previous live event that Ju Deaver, who literally wrote the book, the name of her book is Aquafaba, uh, was a guest. Now I'm holding up some Aquafaba meringue that I made this morning and it held quite nicely. I, You don't wanna see that. I should whip it again before I use it, but I'm not going to because I don't wanna make noise. But I do wanna show you the difference in these two whisks. So I find using a stand mixer makes the most stable meringue, assuming that you have reduced and chilled the aquafaba, the aquafaba, which is chickpea liquid ahead of time. I have had people tell me that you've used an electric hand mixer, just takes longer. This is the size mixer. This is my KitchenAid artisan mixer. Um, that I use if I'm just making a quarter, a half recipe. This is my big seven quart bowl. You can see the whisk is much larger and it, 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 the aquafaba whips into meringue more quickly and I think is more 
stable. So I'm just going to put this out of the way for a moment. Walk over here and show you. This is a baked Alaska that I made last night. It's a layer of chocolate cake. My friend Kathy Gold, who is the owner of In the Kitchen Cooking School and did an event on vanilla, um, gave me these really pretty bakers, these ramekins. So I baked cake right in here and I covered the cake with, you can use any cake you want. If you use a gluten-free cake, you're going to have a gluten-free dessert. I covered it with Oatly ice cream. Sometimes I make my own ice cream, but I use this. I had raspberry swirl, which is really delicious. And it's also very nice for Valentine's Day. And then I piped this meringue on. Most of the time I don't, and I'm gonna show you what I do. But I wanted to see if I could burn it ahead of time and keep it in the freezer and see what would happen. So I put a glass dome over it and it seems like it held beautifully. I'm going to assemble one and torch another for you. This is big. For me, this is a two person dessert, but I'm not judging. That's up to you. So let me get some of the others. Now, this is how I stored this in the freezer. You know, you don't have to have a perfectly shaped cake to go in the bottom of whatever you're serving, you're assembling your baked Alaska in. You can use scraps. Sometimes I just put pieces of cakes to fit. You know, I should probably start and tell, I don't know if every single person knows what baked Alaska is, but it's cake ice cream and meringue, cake, ice cream, and meringue. And you just excuse me for one minute because I have to put my other ear pod, air pod in. There we go. Okay. So this, I know that I wanted to make desserts tonight or showcase desserts tonight so that almost every kind of eater could have a celebratory dessert. And what I mean by that is there are people who are following whole food, plant-based, no oil diets. There are people who are gluten-free. There are people who don't want to bake dessert. What I did here, <laughs> I love these little red cups, is I have a layer of gluten-free brownie. And then, I don't know if you can see it, but I took banana slices that the banana wasn't very, very ripe. So it was easy to do. And with a heart cutters. I cut out little heart shape of bananas and I put them over the cake. And then I added a little bit of cream, cashew cream with a little bit of chocolate folded in. And I would probably add some nuts or cacao nibs, something for a texture, for a contrasting texture and have a very nice dessert here. Um, I know there are a lot of people who love banana desserts. I'm, I like bananas. I don't love banana desserts, but um, I really like eating frozen bananas, you know, taste like ice cream. And if you just keep some frozen banana slices in your freezer, you put them in your food processor. And I do it in my food processor, not in a, in a fancy machine. Um, I know my friend Shar has a, I don't know what it's called. Maybe she'll tell us, but something that makes banana ice cream and you can add fresh fruit, you can add cocoa powder, you can really make a nice ice cream. So here we could have a banana ice cream as well. I'm going to get some meringue on this other aquafaba, on this other baked Alaska or this other <laughs> dish that's going to become a baked Alaska and torch it and then show you a bunch of other desserts. So I have all of my 
supplies ready. At Ruby, we really believe in mise en place, meaning getting everything together, get your nuts roasted and cooled, your chocolate chopped, everything ahead so that you don't have a problem. And it, and it becomes a pleasure. Now, here's my aquafaba. Now I'm working with something that's a bit softer maybe than it should be, but that's okay. And there is no reason to pull out your piping bag unless you want to, you just don't have to. So I like to, when it's a little bit stiffer, just pull it up. I like to put a lot on. What you want to do before you start torching is to make sure that you have a heat proof surface. Don't be doing this in plastic. All right. Now, some of you may have the really big torch. It's very inexpensive. You go to the hardware store and you buy a torch. I've got a small one. There is an option to put some sugar on the meringue, but I don't think it's necessary. And there you have it. Now there, I know I'm in that school that really likes my meringue nice and burned. And here you go. So you can see that this is a dessert that really is a showstopper, but you can make it in advance. You just go ahead, get it all together, put it in your freezer and serve it when you're ready. I see, I want to torch just another minute here. I love using the torch. There we go. All right. So there's my baked Alaska that I just made. And the other one that I made earlier. I'm curious. So indulge me. I want to see what happens if I torch it again. Oh, yeah. Now I made sure <laughs> before the event that my torch was filled with fuel and it is. So now I've got my baked Alaska. I want to show you some other things that you can do with meringue, but my gloves just got sticky. So I'm going to take them off and put new ones on. I like wearing gloves when I'm working in the kitchen and my hands are really beat up from the weather and from doing a whole lot of washing. Um, while I get the other um, item that I made with the meringue. I'm going to take a question. I see I have a question from Cecile C. How does aquafaba turn into meringue? That's actually a really good question because we showed you the video. From what I have been researching, nobody knows for sure. And I, if I'm wrong, if someone has different information, please put it in the chat and let me know. Nobody knows for sure what it is about bean water that helps it foam. It could be the protein, um, but it does work like it does work like an egg white, and it's easier than an egg white. And of course, we don't have to worry about tasting it. We don't have to worry about salmonella that you have to worry about when you're working with raw eggs. Another plus to using aquafaba, which just means bean water. It was discovered by a Frenchman named, Wu I forgot his name, It's but I know his name, Goose Wobit, and um, a number of years ago, and it, it's just exploded. You can also use it as an egg replacer. Now, technically any bean water, in other words, the water that the bean was cooked in, will work, but aqua, but aquafaba bean water from chickpeas, which are also called garbanzo beans, 
are the most neutral in taste and to me the most reliable. Though I did have a student at Essential Vegan Desserts who wanted a purplish colored aquafaba and didn't want to use any coloring. So she made her aquafaba with black beans. There's a, there's a flavor there. I wouldn't do that. So the thing to remember is if you're using canned, uh, the liquid from a can of beans, you're going to, you want to try to use unsalted chickpeas in a can. You want to reduce the liquid, which means to heat it, to simmer it until some of the water boils off until you have about a half a cup. That standardizes it. Chill it. I keep it in the freezer. If you're using chickpea water from homemade dried chickpeas, use a piece of kombu seaweed and I reduce that by at least a half. And when I think it's about a half, I take a little bit. People who work with me know that I'm a big believer in testing. I put a little bit in the refrigerator. If it becomes more viscous, it's ready to go. We have a link for you if you'd like to watch the video with um, the live event, the previous live event with Jude Deeper who talked about it. So thank you for your question, Cecile. And with that, I'm going to show you something else I made using aquafaba. Now, some of you might know what a pavlova is, or if you saw the great British baking show that was scheduled, well, it was last season with Freya Cox, who was our vegan baker. She had a problem with her pavlova. Well, there wasn't enough time allowed. This is something that I made using the same meringue, actually that meringue, I piped it out. I decided to do a design instead of a just a flat bottom pavlova and I dehydrated it. I have a Breville oven that's got, it's a convection oven, it's an air fryer and it has a dehydration, a dehydrator setting. And I dehydrated this for about 10 hours and I'm going to fill it with some cream or something. It's really pretty. And here are some other little pieces of meringue that I also dehydrated. But if you do something like this, in the same way that meringue, egg, egg white meringue gets soggy from being in the air, it, hold, it grabs the moisture, I store mine with food <laughs> safe silica gel in an airtight container. And I find that it holds for a very long time that way. So that's something that you can do with, that's something else you can do with aquafaba. Um, Rose has a question. Hi, Rose. I'm following a whole food plant-based, no oil. W-O-E, would love to know more about baking without oil. I saw some of your questions early and I actually, Rose, had to look up W-O-E dietary system because I didn't know that's the first time I've seen it. And what I learned was it means it stands for way of eating and is a term that's coined to describe a healthy, balanced diet. Well, I hope we're all eating a healthy, balanced diet. I think a healthy plant-based diet is the way to go. Um, I have done a fair amount of baking without oil, as I mentioned earlier, and I bet I mention every single time I have a live event or I'm on any platform that I made Rip Esselstyn's wedding cakes. And we know that the Esselstyns are no oil people. So I had to develop the recipe and I didn't use anything special. It's changed just a tiny little bit over time. I didn't use anything special. A lot of people who do um, no oil baking use applesauce. I like prune puree as well, a fruit sauce to replace the oil. You're not going, you can get a very good result when you follow baking technique. You follow the rules. Technique is the king and queen. You have to follow technique, that's for sure. You have to measure, your oven has to be at temperature, everything matters. And you can get a very nice cake, but 
you're not going to get the same tender crumb that you will get with a cake that's made using some fat, some amount of fat. And so the cake might be a little bit denser. That doesn't mean it won't be good. Whole food uh, cakes that are made without any added fat also dry out more quickly. My cakes are all very moist, but I find these cakes will, let's say, stale a little more quickly, store them in the freezer. So we do, you know, my course, Essential Vegan Desserts, the idea of this course is to teach foundational techniques so that everyone can have a successful result every single time, no matter your dietary preference. I have a lot of students who are not vegan or plant-based. They, I have people who are absolute beginners and people who are professionals. You know, plant-based seems to be the future. It's not going anywhere. But I have people who come in from forks over knives, many people like you who are a whole food plant-based, no oil. And sometimes I suggest a different kind of dessert. And I have a bunch to show you, in fact. So if you are whole food plant-based, no oil, and you don't want to make a cake without oil, this is actually an agar gel that I made. This is one of our assignments. Uh, is There's a red layer of gel and then a cream layer. And I've got some raspberries, a few are stuffed with a little bit of ganache with a very high percentage chocolate. So you're eating like nothing, really a minute. And then I thought, you know, not everybody likes chocolate. It's hard for me to believe not everyone likes chocolate. So here's a little vanilla cake with some red sanding sugar that Kathy brought up for me and fruit. You know, always I want to fill my plates out with fruit because I think that's a way to have your dessert and eat it too and maintain a healthy lifestyle. My desserts tend to be smaller in size with a lot of fruit, but they have to be delicious. If they aren't delicious, you're not, people won't be satisfied. So I want to show you, ah, here it is. I'm walking very slowly. I don't want to drop anything. So here are some, I'm going to pick them up because I've got my gloves on. So here is a gel, someone who is not wanting a baked good, but wants something yummy. I'm going to tell you the secret ingredient in there. And here is another one with a flower on it. And this is a way to have a Valentine dessert that it's pretty. Is not very caloric. I've got a bit of chocolate infused cashew cream, a quarter of a truffle, and a little teeny, teeny, you won't be able to see it, a little tiny cookie. And this is another bit of meringue that I dehydrated and put some chocolate ganache in. So here we go. In our course, we spend quite a bit of time learning how to use agar. Agar is vegetable gelatin. It replaces bovine gelatin and it is a sea vegetable and it has been used for millennia as a gelling agent. It's really, I, I think of it as a secret agent. It does a lot more than just make gels. We can do creme brulees, we can do all kinds of things, frostings using agar. Um, this is just waiting to be filled with fruit and cream and so on. So I'm going to tell you, <laughs> I think you can see that this is a nice red color. Well, I am, I know many of you know that I am determined to use what's in my pantry and not buy ingredients until I've used, I mean, I buy fresh produce every week, but I really want to use the ingredients that I have in my pantry. So I had a little bit of apple juice and I had some, I wanted to make something red for Valentine's day. And I had some Suncor food beet powder. And I thought, well, let's see. I happen to, I happen to like beets. I mean, they're definitely very vegetal, but they are sweet as well. And I 
cooked some of the beet powder into the apple juice and I loved the taste. I just loved it. I happen to like um, putting some vegetables and herbs into desserts. I think it makes it very interesting. And I got this very nice gel, this very nice gel that I will be serving with a strawberry cream, an unsweetened strawberry cream. So, you know, there are lots of things that we can do. Lots of things that we can do. But more on the treat side, here are some cookies that I made. These are not shortbread cookies. These are more akin to, to me, they taste like, they remind me of my childhood. I loved arrowroot cookies. And this is a cookie that is made entirely with maple syrup. There's no granulated sugar. In this, there's no granulated cane sugar. I have nothing against using <laughs> cane sugar, coconut sugar, uh, whole, whole cane sugar. I just got some black sugar, Japanese black sugar, because I'm doing desserts. But I rolled these cookies and then I made like what I would call little Linzer cookies by spreading these with jam. This larger one was filled with some chocolate ganache. And these were baked this way with a little bit of sanding sugar. They can be shined up if you want, but I didn't want to. I wanted to see what would happen. This one has a little bit of gold luster dust on the chocolate ganache that I dipped it in. I find that if you use a, make a, use a good chocolate, a couverture chocolate, Follow the recipe carefully and don't refrigerate it. The ganache, don't refrigerate it. The ganache will hold um, without being tempered. And here's just another little cookie. I've been nibbling on a lot of these. I have to admit to you that I've been doing that. And then I would say another dessert is here I have Kathy's ramekin again. This is a cake that I baked right in here. I hollowed the center out. I kept the plug and I put a chocolate truffle in here inside and then put the plug back in. I don't personally love lava cakes. I find a lava cake meaning usually it's a chocolate cake and you cut them open and chocolate comes oozing out. And, you know, and that's very nice and it's very dramatic. I find many of them are gooey inside. The cake part doesn't taste great to me. So I've discovered a couple of years ago that by making the cake and then putting a truffle in or some chocolate ganache and warming it in the oven for a little while or even in the microwave for a little while, depending on what you want to use, you get a really nice lava cake. And so that's, that's my answer to that. Um, so I've got cookies, I've got baked Alaska, I've got this banana. You know, this cream is a chocolate cashew cream, but I was thinking with the bananas, it would be really yummy with a peanut butter cream, and then we could call it an Elvis. Um, all you know, the pavlova and the baked Alaska's all ready to go. And again, for people who don't want chocolate, there, you don't have to have, you don't have to have chocolate. And do you want to think about fruit? You know, you can have a fruit plate for dessert. Just we eat with our eyes, make it look pretty, use some edible flowers. I want to show you something that my friend Kathy Gold, I've mentioned Kathy three times today, but she really helped me out. Kathy showed me how to do. Oh, so here, if you just want a little raspberry with a little more, put some chocolate in it. So these, these are on paper towels because I wanted to keep them clean, but this is a heart shape. <laughs> strawberry. Now I am a seasonal eater, so I don't usually buy strawberries in the winter time, but I, it was for Valentine's day. I went looking and I found these organic strawberries that actually tasted really good. Strawberries are one fruit that I won't eat unless they're organic. I follow the 
Environmental Working Group has what they a list that's updated every year called the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. Strawberries for years have been on the Dirty Dozen list, I think, as number one. So here are the strawberries. And all I did to make the hearts was cut out the little core. I save the scraps and I save the greens and I make a strawberry infused beverage. It's just a light, you know, water. I, I try to drink water all day long and this, the water with the scraps and the greens will taste like strawberry. And then, so this core comes out, you cut the strawberry in half and it looks like a heart already. And then you can shape them even more if you like to. So I think I want to get to some more questions here. Um, Tina, hi, Tina wants to know, is there a good recipe for vegan whipped cream? We're always missing that topping in our house. Well, Tina, I will say that most many people who are avoiding dairy make whipped, a whipped cream or a whipped cream substitute using full fat coconut milk or coconut cream. You can beat it by in an, with a hand mixer or in a standing mixer or use an ISI whip and you've got a nice, you know, there is going to be some taste of coconut, that's for sure, but it works very nicely. I use aquafaba. I would use the aquafaba as a, I prefer that as a whipped cream topping. And then you can, it's not whipped cream, but you can also use a tofu cream. That works really nicely. So, <clears throat> excuse me, Abby says, fruit tarts are the bomb diggity in my house. I like that. Excuse me, I just need to take a sip of water here. What ingredients would you include for a vegan custard for the tart? Well, if you want a custard, you're going to use a rich plant milk. And I would say a little bit of agar for body and a starch slurry, like you're making a pudding. And then that would really work. And how would you make the sugar cookie crust? There are so many cookie crusts available um, to you, Abby. I'm just going to say this generally because this is something I believe in 100%. There are a lot of recipes available. You don't have to reinvent the wheel anymore when you're doing vegan desserts, but make sure that you're not just Googling cookie crust vegan and following a recipe from someone you don't know. Find recipes from, reli in, from reliable recipe writers. There are wonderful books and of course, essential vegan desserts. So not to worry about your sugar cookie crust. It's doable. Marie says, what would like to know what are some of the basic ingredients for vegan baking to keep in the pantry oh oh sean marie i'm sorry well i'm thinking about my pantry <laughs> and i have a lot of ingredients but the very basic and you're talking about baking you need flour so preferably organic and unbleached whole wheat pastry flour that's different from whole wheat flour and all-purpose flour, keep them in the refrigerator. You want some sweeteners, so vegan cane sugar, coconut sugar, there are a number, and some liquid sweeteners, a fat of some kind, liquid fat. I like using sunflower oil or a mild-tasting extra virgin olive oil. When I switched from the traditional world to the vegan world and was you know, coming up with vegan ideas, there weren't these wonderful butters like Miyoko's butters. And then you need leavening, you need baking powder, baking soda and vinegar and plant milk. And then if you're going to be doing chocolate desserts, you want cocoa and chocolate and some nuts and seeds. So I would say that's where you would get started there. Any gluten-free options? Molly wants to know tons of gluten-free options. There are many. I am personally not gluten-free. I have gluten-free people in my family. And while Essential Vegan Desserts is not specifically a gluten-free course, we have many gluten-free uh, recipes in the course. 
We have some gluten-free baked goods. I have many cookies that are gluten-free and all of these kinds of gelled desserts or puddings, fruit desserts, they're all naturally gluten-free. I think people forget that sometimes that, you know, you can be a no, a whole food plant-based, no oil eater and a gluten-free eater by poaching a pear, baking an apple. We do a roasted fruit in the course. Delicious. Absolutely delicious. So Mital would like some gluten-free low fat options. Uh, well, as I said, there are many, you just have to do a little bit of looking, but you want to make sure that you're using a reliable recipe, gluten-free and low fat is a little bit more difficult. Let's see, Annabelle, what source would you recommend to improve? This is a very interesting question. Thank you. Uh, improve food writing. I'm having a hard time describing food where it would paint an exact picture in the reader's mind as if they were tasting the food. Any source that, any recommendation? That's a great question. And I know there's a link here. I sent Patrick a link. Here you go. I reached out to my friend, Joy Manning, who is a wonderful writer, a professional writer. And I asked her, what she would recommend beyond what I recommend. And I recommend this book by Diane Jacobs. This is the newest edition. It's called Will Write for Food. And it's really robust. She has everything in here on how to write recipes, how to find your voice, cookbooks, blogs, and writing exercises. So this is a place to start. Will Write for Food. Will write for food is a great title, and um, and also if you wanted, if you were interested in taking a writing course, then you can look into the one that Joy recommended. So thank you for asking that. Also, you want to practice. I mean, just practice writing. Just practice writing. Pay attention to what it is that you're making. How does it smell? What does the texture look like? and describe it to yourself and describe it to someone else. And you will, you will get it. You will get it. Barbara says, I'd like to become, become a better baker. Can you give me three tips? Um, <laughs> I don't know, Barbara, if I can narrow it down to three, but this is what I would say. Measure carefully. So I, I like to weigh my ingredients and keep a note of that. Measure carefully. Make sure your oven racks are set correctly in the proper position in your oven. Pies, you want to get the pie crust set quickly. Bake the pies or at least start them on the lower rack. But if you do that with cookies, you're going to burn the bottom of your cookies. Cakes tend to bake in the middle. I'll give your oven enough time to preheat. You know, my ovens, ding, ding, ding. They tell me that they're ready. I have oven thermometers in them. They are certainly not ready. It can take as long as 45 minutes to preheat your oven. So make sure that your oven is preheated and that you have an oven thermometer. Read the recipe carefully and all the way through. If something doesn't make sense, find out why. And um, again, Choose a recipe from a trusted source. Use quality ingredients. You can't make something taste good. You know, you can't make <laughs> a strawberry cream if your strawberries are moldy or off. If your flour is rancid, it's going, if your nuts are rancid, it's going to come through. So treat your, buy quality ingredients and store them properly. Definitely do a mise en place. Definitely do a mise en place. And then go for it. If you're testing recipes, if you have a recipe that you want to make, um, but you're not sure about the result, always start with the recipe as written. Again, the assumption is it's a good recipe. And I tell my students in the course, make the recipe as written the first time, scale it by a half if you want to. Sometimes you can even do that by a quarter you have that way a baseline before you start experimenting. So there you go. I hope that helped. Oh, hi, Char. This is Chef Char, 
who is with Ruby. And I know Char, Chef Char has, I mean, she's a, we've been friends for a really long time, but Char has a, um, a live event coming up. So look for it. So Char was recently reading an article by Rose Levy Berenbaum. I want to stop and say Rose is, <laughs> Rose wrote the cake Bible and the pie Bible. She knows everything. And I'm so happy to have known her personally for so many years and very proud to say that Rose has me on her website, Real Baking with Rose, as a vegan expert. So because she has started getting some vegan questions. So Char, this is an interesting question. Char saw an article by Rose on how to peel hazelnuts by boiling them in water with some sodium bicarbonate baking soda. Does the bicarbonate tamper with the flavor of the hazelnuts? And Char wrote filberts because hazelnut and filberts, the same thing. And have I ever done this with almonds? Okay. That's a really good question. Peeling, you know, hazelnut, the skin of hazelnuts, the brown skin of hazelnuts, it's a bit on the bitter side. And so that's a nut that we tend to rub the skin off or most of it. You can buy them already, you know, peeled, but I tend not to do that. So you can, there are two ways to do it. I tend to, rather than do what Rose was describing, I like to roast the nuts in an oven about 350 degrees on a parchment lined sheet pan. You have to watch carefully because the length of time, and this goes with almonds, with all nuts, depends on the age of the nuts, how fresh they are or not fresh they are. Um, and then you'll see the skin start to wrinkle. And then I have, <laughs> I have some dish, I want to call them dishcloths, tea, tea towels, some that are for veg, wrapping my vegetable green, my salad greens, some are for wiping my dishes, and some are for nuts. Because when I rub the hazelnuts, that's what you do when they're hot, in the dish towels, that they do discolor some. So it's a little messy. Or sometimes I take the toasted hazelnuts and I push, the, I rub them in on a sieve. And that takes most of the skin off. Why I like prefer that method is because then the nuts get toasted at the same time as they get skinned. Now, when you're blanching them, and that's the method that Rose is referring to, and it definitely works. For about every half cup of hazelnuts, boil up one and a half cups of water, add about two tablespoons of baking soda and boil. The water is going to turn black. You don't want to overboil them. Um, and then you drain the nuts and you run them over cold water. And the nuts, this, the skin should slip off, but you're going to be doing one at a time. And then you dry them and toast them before you use them. So I, you know, whatever Rose says, I, I rely, Rose is so, <laughs> she's so scientific in her methods. And so that will work, but I'm going to stick with the toasting. In terms of almonds, I think um, that you do, that they do pick up the flavor of the baking soda. So I don't do that. When I want blanched almonds, I, I buy almonds with the skin on, the brown skin, the whole almonds, and I will just dip them into some boiling water. You see this, sometimes it takes a little longer. Again, it depends on the age of the nuts. You see the skin kind of wrinkle. Some people say just put them in water overnight. And then I just sit and pop the skins off. <laughs> it's kind of fun, but carefully because they go flying. They go flying. So I hope that answered your question, Char. I won't be doing that with almonds. Um, Joseph has a question about making a chocolate ganache. So if there's anyone here who isn't familiar with a ganache, typically a ganache is a percentage or proportion of heavy cream and chocolate. And sometimes butter is added, sometimes cream, uh, different things are added and it's chocolate and cream. 
Vegan ganache is a thing. I use it all the time. We make it in the course. We make a rather lean one, which is just plant milk and chocolate. You can enrich it if you want to. And I have made it successfully with every milk. I, um, I really like using oat milk. I think it's rich. I think the flavor is good. And then I don't have to worry about the soy avoiders. Soy milk makes a wonderful ganache. The soy avoiders, the nut allergic people. But, and it works fine. And it really, it really is nice and rich. But Joseph is saying when using cashew milk or almond milk instead, oh, yeah, that's the guidance is, you know, follow, follow a good recipe that it's just cashew milk and almond milk are great milks for making chocolate ganache. It's going to work really, really well. Um, find the formula that works. My formula is depends on what the ganache is going to be used for. If it's going to be used to make truffles, because the inside of a truffle is ganache, then it might be one-to-one -one plant milk and chocolate. And if it's a pouring glaze, it's going to be maybe one and a quarter to one and a half to one. The, th the key is that the recipe should specify the percentage of chocolate to use. Meaning if you, if the recipe says 70 to 72% chocolate, you should use the one that tastes good to you right out of the package, but you should use that percentage. If you go ahead and use a 55%, your ganache is going to be off. So I hope that helps, Joseph. I have some ganache on the stove. I always have it available in my freezer to rewarm and reliquify and so on. Despina has an interesting question, and I'm afraid I don't have an answer. Is there a brand of white chocolate that does chips that does not have oil or sugar? Not that I've seen. Um, and the white chocolate, the vegan white chocolate chips. They're so waxy tasting to me. I really, I don't prefer them at all. And I don't use very much. And I'm going to see somewhere here. I have a, oh, here it is. I have this nice piece of white chocolate. This is a bonbon from Sajak, Simply White Chocolate Heart. His are good. Uh, you know, white chocolate should be cocoa butter, which is the fat in chocolate. <laughs> primarily, but you know, there's just so much oil and uh, it doesn't taste good to me. It doesn't taste good. So if you want to use white chocolate, then you're going to have to, there is nothing that doesn't have oil or sugar in it. How long do you reduce the aquafaba? Julietta is asking. It depends. It depends on how much you're starting with. Um, a typical can will have two thirds to three quarters of a cup of liquid and I put it in a rather wide saucepan because the wider the pan, the faster, whatever it is you're reducing is going to reduce. I bring it to a kind of a low boil. If any bean scum comes up, I don't know another word for that, I skim it off. So it usually takes me about 10 minutes for a can. The when I'm making it myself, it takes longer. I just discovered this this week and I'm feeling like a genius. So I cook chickpeas, dried chickpeas in my Instant Pot. And again, you, you really wanna use a piece of uh, kombu seaweed, both for the health benefits of cooking your beans, but it makes a stronger aquafaba. And then I drained the chickpeas when they were finished, which I usually do, and I was getting ready to pull out my big saucepan to reduce this aquafaba, and I thought, no, I'm going to do that in my, put the liquid right back in my Instant Pot, and I did, and it reduced, I don't know how long it took, um, because it depends on the how high you're, you know, what you're starting with. It just Depends. So all reduction means is that you're cooking some of the water out and you're going to get a more viscous result, a more viscous result. So I've got four questions in a row about reducing the aquafaba. So I'm just going to five. <laughs> I reduce it by about 25 to 30 percent. 
So if a can of chickpeas gives me three quarters of a cup of aquafaba, I reduce it to a half cup. If I've cooked chickpeas from scratch and I have three cups of liquid, maybe I will reduce that probably closer to a cup, cup and a half. And that's really the answer. That's really the answer. There are a lot of recipes for me, will say, drain the can of chickpeas, put the liquid in your mixer, add a pinch of cream of tartar because that will stabilize it. Or you can use lemon juice or you can use a little bit of vinegar and start beating. It works sometimes. I don't want things to work sometimes. I want things to work all the time and I want my aquafaba to be strong. You saw that this is still holding from the morning um, and I could rebeat it again. So always reduce and chill your aquafaba. Sandra says, I'm tired of paying five to six dollars for a quart of plant-based coffee cream and then not liking it. Do you have a recipe? I don't have a recipe. I use oat milk or soy milk as my creamer and I froth it. I have a frother and I like the way it froths. But I can tell you that coffee cream is just plant milk with more fat in it, more oil in it. And so you don't really have to pay that. Try you try finding a plant milk or rich plant milk, try a barista blend. That's something that you might like. Plain, you know, a plain flavor. I mean, I don't know. You might like flavor in your coffee creamer. I like my coffee plain. Um, but try a barista brand. And that's what I would say. Or a plant milk that tastes good to you plain, add a little bit of fat to it and see if, if that will work for you. Roseanne, hi. Roseanne says, I want to thank you for the hosting these sessions. Well, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. This is a really fun part. I love it. I love doing these live events. It's very, it's very joyful for me. Um, so Roseanne is just getting into a vegan diet and needs all the help she can get and the finding the sessions valuable. Thank you so much and happy. Valentine's Day to you as well. I just got my first Valentine's Day card from my friend Diane Wins, which was really sweet. Um, Nancy wants to know, please share some nut alternatives for people who have allergies. Well, there are a lot of people who have allergies to nuts, that's for sure. For the crunch, of a walnut, for example, I like using cacao nibs. They're just slightly bitter, like a walnut is slightly bitter, and it's got that nice crunch. Um, there are some seeds that work, so you really shouldn't have a problem today. There are many alternatives. It depends what it is. You know, if it's a plant milk, then use oat milk instead, or instead of almond milk, cashew milk. <laughs> hazelnut milk. I have made things with hemp milk. I find that a little vegetal, but I make a salad dressing with it that I like very much. Um, so Nancy, grains and seeds, if you can have some of those are very nice. You know, sesame seeds, they are considered an allergen. I don't know what your particular allergies are, but definitely try the cacao nibs in place of walnuts. Hi, Terry Lynn. Terry Lynn wants to know, besides strawberries and raspberries, what are some decadent fruits to use for a Valentine's treat? Well, blood oranges are in season right now where I live, and I think they are pretty decadent. They are so beautiful, so red inside. You know, my son and his family live in Los Angeles, and when I used to go and visit on a regular basis, I would come home with lemons from the trees and Meyer lemons and blood oranges and so on. I, I look for things that are in season. Also, pomegranate arrows are beautiful looking and healthy and taste really good too. I like, I'm an apple person. I really like apples. I like mandarin oranges. So that's what I would say, Terry Lynn, and happy Valentine's Day to you. 
Joseph says, I don't filter my homemade nut milk. Do you have to filter them when making ganache? Um, you're going to get a gritty ganache if you don't. So I would say yes, definitely. And Mary Jo, what's the best piece of equipment to use for grinding granulated sugar into castor sugar? That's a good question. And I think <laughs> somewhere here I pulled some because the um, meringue is made with castor sugar. I don't buy castor sugar, which is just super fine. Depends on which side of the pond you're on. If I'm doing a quantity, and most often I do a quantity, I just don't like to stop and say, oh, I need three tablespoons of castor sugar. So I do a quantity in my high-speed blender. I have a dry bowl for grinding things like sugar. I often just use the regular bowl. If I'm just doing a small amount, I use a small nut and seed grinder. I have one by Cuisinart. You put the top on and it grinds. That sugar, because it, I'm using vegan sugar and some of the molasses is retained, meaning the sugar is more humic, is more hygroscopic. Sometimes it will lump a little. So I sift it but I store it airtight and that's all you need. Just do it in your, in a blender in a high speed blender. You'll see it turn into castor sugar. I rough up my sugar in a food processor. And what I mean by that is again, because I'm using vegan sugar is the crystal is larger than that of a white sugar crystal. So I rough that up in the food processor because I don't want to grind it. I just want to, make it a little bit smaller. And I do that and keep that in a jar as well. Hi, Vicki. Vicki says beginner's question. I don't think there are any beginner's question. <laughs> when you say to use 70 to 75% chocolate for your ganache glaze, are you talking about buying a chocolate bar at the grocery store? Yes, I am. I have in my chocolate pantry, <laughs> um, I have big bags of couverture chocolate in different percentages, but also almost all grocery stores today have chocolate bars that are labeled with the percentage. This is something we didn't have years ago. We just didn't, but people know. Char Nolan took me to a grocery store that I had never been to a couple of weeks ago. I think it's called Lidl, Lidl and they private label chocolate bars. So it was very inexpensive. Shar said, well, the quality here is very good. I brought home two of their 72% chocolate bars. They're Swiss chocolate, absolutely delicious. So what I will say, Vicki, is that you might think, or many of you might think that every 70%, every 72, every 75%, 80 is going to taste the same. They don't. Chocolate makers have proprietor, proprietary ways of making their chocolate. So some are going to, you know, they're just going to taste different. Buy a few, see which one you like the best. Because when you make something like a chocolate ganache, the taste of the chocolate is going to come through. Jeanette wants to know, can I directly substitute vanilla for chocolate in a recipe? No, 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 <laughs> you can't. Um, if, if what you're asking, Jeanette, is can you take the cocoa powder out of a cake recipe? No, because cocoa powder is a flour, so it's better to have a vanilla recipe. Last month's live event, um, I made vanilla, we actually made vanilla cake, or I talked about vanilla cake and I, it's flour and leavening, baking powder, baking soda, vinegar, some sugar and, or sugar, maybe maple syrup and vanilla. You want to use a good vanilla. Actually, this is a good place for this link. Um, I asked Patrick to put a link into the document, into the <laughs> Q&A here. I did an event with Chef Kathy Gold on vanilla last year, I think. Since, since COVID, I have no recollection of time, to be perfectly honest with you. And 
Kathy really is an expert on vanillas. I use pure vanilla and there are many vanilla companies that are pure vanilla, make a beautiful pure vanilla. But she told me about a company in New Zealand, in Tonga, a woman owned company called Hey Lala, Hey Lala. And I looked into them and I just loved the story. I loved how they came into being and how the company was handled and the vanilla products are brilliant. Some of you may know that Tonga was hit by a terrible hurricane and they are in terrible trouble. So um, I put a link in my newsletter, which is <laughs> called Cold Temps and Warm Hearts. That has nothing to do with anything. If anyone's interested in um, the Tonga Relief Fund that Hey Lala Vanilla has set up, you can find it there. You're also going to find out about the products. You're also going to find out about baking powder and baking soda in that particular um, newsletter. Regina wants to know, is caster sugar the exact same thing as powdered sugar? That's a good question and an important question. In the United States anyway, powdered sugar refers to what's called 10, typically seen in the markets as 10X sugar. It's very finely ground powdered sugar with a starch in it. Typically it's cornstarch, vegan powdered sugar often has tapioca instead and um, instead of the cornstarch. So they're not the same at all. They're not the same at all. And I cannot in my machine get a powdered sugar, you know, as fine as the powdered sugars that you purchase and the X, <laughs> the different X's tell us just the, you know, the fineness of that particular that particular sugar. Um, Regina has another question here. To make colored meringue cookies, what's the best type of food coloring to use? She's worried about deflating the meringue. There are a lot of things that deflate the meringue. I like using, and I will fold it in a little at a time to some, I like using powdered freeze-dried fruit to color because that also gives a really nice flavor or some of the Suncor food colors. But again, very gently, take some out of your bowl, fold it in carefully, and it should be fine. Faye wants to know, if kept in the freezer, won't the cake be frozen? How long ahead should we take it out? I think you're talking about the baked Alaska. Yes, the cake will be frozen, so you wanna take it out a bit ahead of time also, so the ice cream can soften a bit. Um, my way of getting around the cake being frozen, because that's a little unpleasant, is I tend to use brownies, which my brownies don't freeze solid. They stay chewy. I have a gluten-free one. We have a gluten-free one and, um, and a non-gluten and a wheat one, and they stay flexible. So let's see. Kyle wants to know, sometimes I find it difficult to find unsalted, low-sodium canned garbanzo beans. Well, a it's not going to affect, it's, it's going to whip, but your, your meringue, especially because you are reducing it, can taste salted. Kyle, maybe you want to cook some chickpeas from scratch. Why don't you try doing that? Um, Mimi, want, Mimi, hi Mimi, wants to know if I make any desserts with lavender. I do. Um, more towards the spring, but I will infuse edible lavender, you know, into my plant milks in the same way that I infuse my plant milks with rosemary and thyme or ancho chili powder. And then you can make lovely lovely puddings. Um, Jeanette, want, Jeanette has a histamine intolerance and dates, raisins are a big problem. Is that even when you buy 
I'm wondering if Jeanette, if you purchase ones that are sulfite free, if that is still a problem, because I only buy sulfite free raisins, dates, all of my dried fruits. And then I think it's not a problem, but in terms of a sweetener that replicates the sweetness of dates, I mean, dates are very sweet and I, <laughs> I have 15 pounds in my home now that I bought from Rancho Metalucho. I use date syrup, Ceylon, but, um, you know, I don't really know what's going to replicate that particular sweetener. If, if it is a matter of just dates and raisins, maybe you can try apricots. I think apricots, dried apricots are very sweet and very, very delicious. Zach wants to know, how do you make vanilla ganache? Um, I haven't, uh, to me, ganache is a chocolate mixture. It's a chocolate ganache. But if I were making a vanilla ganache, I would say it would be a white chocolate ganache. And I haven't used that. Um, Julieta wants to know what gluten-free flour recipe do I recommend that doesn't contain garbanzo beans? Bob's Red Mill, one-to-one -one in the blue package, all-purpose, gluten-free baking flour to me is the best. There is no garbanzo bean in that one. She stays away from Red Mill. And I think maybe you mean Bob's because of the plastic packaging, Julieta. I think it's the best one. I think it's the best one for me. Um, it's one o'clock in the morning in the Canary Islands and you're here, Alaria. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Some of you who have, who come regularly know that this is a different time. We us usually have these events at four o'clock, <laughs> but we wanted it because it's a Valentine's Day, start a little bit later. Um, Let's see, I have a question here about the aquafaba with a hand mixer. You can use a hand mixer. It's just gonna take a lot more time. You know, the bigger the whisk, <laughs> the faster it's going to go. But I have people telling me that they can. Um, good, oh, hi, Laura. You notice someone asked for fruit beyond strawberry raspberry. <gasps> You're using frozen dark Michigan cherries for fillings and currants for scones. Mm, that sounds delicious. I love cherries and I saw some frozen cherries recently. So of course you're in Michigan and I'm sure your cherries are delicious. That's another, that's another. Thanks, Laura. If you cook straight in the ramekin, how do you adjust the baking time? It's not the ramekin that's the baking time. It's the size of the cake and so on. So if it's the first time I've done it, then I'll look at the recipe and say, okay, an eight inch cake takes 25 to 30 minutes. I think I'm gonna check this at 20, but it has a lot to do with the depth as well. As you start testing, you get a sense of it. I never leave. I never leave the kitchen because I really wanna know what's up. I'm almost out of time here, but I wanna to get to a couple more questions. The machine is called the Jonas, yes. So as I said, I make my banana-based ice creams just in my food processor, and I think it works great. But if you want it to look like frozen yogurt, get yourself a Yonanas machine, I, that's for sure. Do you have to torch the aquafaba and baked Alaska? You don't have to. Typically, it's torched. And when it was served in these fancy shops, what wasn't vegan, there was a, a depression made in the center, and alcohol was poured in. And it was lit on fire. So no, you don't have to, but it really is nice. And if you don't have a torch, you can run it under the broiler. Um, so the last question here, doctor, from Dr. Will, the gut doctor, but he's not asking it, Holly's asking it. Does aquafaba from a particular bean cause any added flatulence? Um, I am not finding a problem with aquafaba and flatulence. I'm not eating the amount of aquafaba that I would in a plate of hummus, for example. So I'm not having a problem uh, with it at all. You'll have to see how it works for you. And again, if aquafaba isn't your jam or you don't want to do it, you know, make something like this, make something like this. So 
I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to wish you all a very, and thank you for those good questions too. I want to wish you all very happy Valentine's holiday, happy February in general. Take care of yourselves. Again, feel free to reach out to me at brownatruby.com if you have any questions for me in general <laughs> or about essential vegan desserts, let me know. And I will see you next month, which is March. And we're getting closer to spring. I'm not a winter person, so I'm really excited about that. And I'm going to be doing office hours instead of a different kind of a live event. Um, I hope to see you there. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And just remember, eat your greens and grains and save room for dessert.